Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. Today we're going to look into A-level physics, structure of the atom, and fundamental particles. And this is the chapter outline. Now let's start off with some history of nuclear physics. So the great philosopher Democritus proposed that all matter is proposed of this tiny little atoms here. And he believed that these atoms are different in terms of size, shape, and also motion, forming the foundation of matter. And soon after, J.J. Thomson discovered that there is an internal structure within e these atoms, and he called it the plum pudding model, in which within each atom, it consists of positively charged proton and negatively charged electrons. And he hypothesized that this is how it's going to look like. When alpha particle is discovered, it is used to prop the atom structure. And by observing how this little particles interact with the alpha particles, scientists have figured out that plum pudding model is not the correct model, which leads to Ernest Rutherford experiment. So this is how the experiment looked like. A beam of alpha particles were directed at thin sheets of gold foil, and there's this circular flop screen that detect the particle's trajectory. And when particle hit the screen, they created tiny flashes of light, indicating their deflection angle. Okay, this is the outcome of the experiment. Most particles pass straight, indicating that atom mostly consists of empty space. And some particles were deflected, but only slightly. And it occurred when the alpha particles pass through near the nucleus. They are deflected because they are repelled. And some, a tiny small fraction of alpha particles, they literally take a U. And this happened when alpha particles directly collided with the dense positively charged nucleus. So the significance of the outcome is that Ernest disproved the plum pudding model because if atom is a plum pudding model, alpha particle would just pass straight through and there should be no deflection because it's much heavier. What the outcome says is that, hey, atom should look like this, which is what we know as the nuclear model, solar system model, in which the atom mass and positively charged are concentrated in a small dense nucleus, which explain why the particles were deflected. So now we know that this is how an atom look like internally. The next few minutes, I'm going to talk in depth about the particles that is inside an atom. So first of all, let's understand the atomic scale. So it is quite inconvenient to say that well, the radius of a proton is 10 to the power of negative 10. This is why scientists have created a unit called meter, and it stands for 10 to the power of negative 15, and it allows scientists to communicate easily. And for electrons here, they are always considered as having zero size because they are very, very small. Now, calculating proton's density, we know the mass of the proton, and we know the radius of it, so we can use the radius to calculate the volume, which will help us to figure out the density of a single proton. As you can see here, the number is very huge, and the proton is approximately 10 to the power 14 and 15 times dense than ordinary objects. So they are very dense particles. So that's all about proton. Let's move on to nucleons. So nucleons are the particles inside the nucleus. It includes the protons and the nucleon, whereas nucleon number is just the number of protons and nucleon in the nucleus. So in this case, my nucleon number will be 7. Another thing that you need to know is that the concept of unified atomic mass unit. So this unit is 1 12th of the mass of carbon-12. The reason why we do 1 12th is because carbon contains 6 protons and 6 neutrons. And by doing 1 12th of carbon-12 atom, we approximate the mass of a single proton and neutron. The reason why we use unified atomic mass is also very similar to why we use 1 femtometer, is to avoid extremely small values when we are stating the numbers. So instead of saying 1.7 times 10 to the power of negative 27, we could do 1.007u, which helps us to compare two particles easily. Now you also need to know about what nuclides and nuclide notation is. Nuclide is a specific type of atom defined by its number of protons and neutrons, and this is how the notation. Let's just give you some example. The number here represent the number of protons, and the number here represent the number of nuclei, which is the sum of protons and neutrons. Another concept, isotopes. This is the atom with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. They have the same chemical properties, but they have different nuclear properties. Different number of neutrons also mean that they have different mass, density, and boiling point. So these are some examples of isotope, hydrogen, carbon, chlorine, uranium and neon. Well, so far, the atom that we look at, they are neutrally charged. So how do we create ions? 
we have a positive ion if there are more protons than electrons. It means that one of the electrons might have get knocked off. And the atom will tend to become a negative ion if there is more electron than protons. So that's all the basics you need to know about what's inside an atom. Now let's look into something more invisible, which is the nuclear force. Nuclear force is a powerful force that binds protons and neutrons in the nucleus. It's the force that holds them together. And what it does is to overcome the electrostatic repulsion because these are positively charged protons. They naturally they should repel each other. So to make sure that they are together, we have nuclear force. And the key point is that it acts over a very short range, only within the nucleus. So a large nucleus tends to be unstable because more protons and electrostatic repulsion will be greater. So neutrons are the ones that counteract the instability and by providing additional nuclear force without increasing repulsion because they don't have charge. So stable nuclei often have equal number of protons and neutrons. And for larger elements, it requires more neutrons than protons to offset the repulsive forces. Neutron to proton ratio will increase with atomic number. However, scientists found out that nuclei with more than 83 protons, they are inherently unstable, no matter how many neutrons you have. For example, uranium-238. Understanding the stability of an atom helps us to understand how radiation occurs. So Henry Becquerel discovered radiation while studying phosphorescent material. He observed that uranium salts emitted energy that could fog photographic plate even without sunlight. And the other scientists, they expanded the study discovering polonium and radium. Alright, so in this video, we're going to learn about alpha, beta, and gamma rays. They are emitted by unstable nuclei of atom. So just now we learned when an atom will become unstable. So the reason why we want to learn that is because it relates to radiation. So to achieve stability, the nucleus will release radiation, transforming it into a more stable state. So these are the characteristics of the three types of radiation. Alpha particles, they are the heaviest. This is a symbol. They are made up of two protons and two neutrons. Beta particles, made up of only one electron. Something new for you is beta plus particles, which we call a positron. It is just an electron, but it is positively charged. Gamma ray is just um, electromagnetic radiation. So more characteristics here, that's their speed. You can see alpha particles is the slowest and gamma ray is the fastest of their mass as well. And this is how they can penetrate through different materials. Just an illustration to show you that alpha particles has the least penetrating power, whereas gamma ray has the most penetrating power. All right, let's dive deep into what's the characteristic of alpha particles. First of all, they are heavy, so they move at a slower speed, and they are made up of two protons and two neutrons, and they are released when an unstable nucleus releases an alpha particle. So high ionization, they can ionize atoms really easily, transferring energy and losing momentum. Short range, they can only travel a few centimeters in air. That's because they are being absorbed by atoms easily. As for beta particles, they are much smaller and they ionize atoms less effectively because they have less charge. And they travel through material much easily compared to alpha particles. They can penetrate up to a few millimeters of human tissue and absorb by one cm of aluminum. So in your IGCSE, you should have learned the characteristic of beta decay. And this is how it looks like. Beta decay happens when there is too many neutrons in the nucleus and the neutron dec decay into proton and an electron which is released as beta particle. And what's new for you is that it could also be that the nucleus has too many protons and this proton turns into a neutron and a positively charged electron which is emitted as beta plus particles. We call it positron. Now what is positron? It's called an antiparticle of the electron it has the same mass, but it carries a positive charge. And it consists of particles that are opposite of ordinary matter particles. So electrons negatively charged, pos positively charged. And positron and electrons means destroy completely. Upon contact, releasing energy as gamma ray, which leads us to gamma ray. So gamma ray is a form of electromagnetic radiation. So it at the end of the electromagnetic spectrum and they have no mass and no electrical charges and they have low ionization but high penetration because they are so quick they penetrate quickly that's why they they couldn't ionize that effectively as alpha and beta particle also because it has no charge and they are emitted 
after alpha and beta decay. And after that emission, the nucleus will become a more stable atom. Well, having talked about the different types of radiation, we will now talk about the energy involved in this radiation. As for alpha particles, let's say there are many alpha particles being they will all have the same kinetic energy. They'll move at the same speed. Whereas for beta particles, before you understand how it varies, let's understand a term called electron volt. So an electron volt is the energy gained by the electron when it is accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. So this is the amount and that's basically the amount of a single charge, one coulomb of charge. And the way we calculate is V equal to W over Q. So what is the energy gained by the electron, which is the work done when it is accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. So if you rearrange the formula, you will get the same value. And the reason why we want to use electron volt is so that it helps us to represent tiny energies better. So previously we have learned about femtometer. We have also learned about unified atomic mass. So now electron volt, they all serve the same purpose to avoid using extremely small value. So just now we mentioned that alpha particles, they all have the same kinetic energy. For beta, it's a little bit different. It do not have consistent energy. This is because during beta, decay, the energy is not just gained by the beta particle, some of it also go to the electron antineutrino. And what is an electron antineutrino? It is a nearly massless, chargeless particles emitted. It carries away part of the energy, which explains why beta particles have varying energy. So the particle released during this positive emission is known as electron neutrino which is this electron neutrino. So for all the decay, they all obey the same law, conservation of protons and neutrons. So if you look at the alpha decay, before and after the, the number of nucleon and the number of protons are conserved. 234 plus 4, 238, 90 plus 292. Same goes to beta minus decay. Even though they have released one more electron, the original nucleus has one additional proton to balance out the electron. Beta plus is the same left-hand side equal to right-hand side. And this is the antineutrino, which has no charge. However, one thing you do need to know is that in this process, mass is not conserved. Meaning if before the reaction is one kilogram, after the reaction, it could be 0 0.99999 kilogram. And where, where does the loss mass go? According to the equation E equal to mc square, the loss mass has been converted into energy. Now, the last part of the chapter, we're going to talk about subatomic particles. Initially, electrons, proton, and neutron, they are all considered fundamental particles because they are so small. So scientists begin to uncover more particles that didn't fit this simple pattern. They realized that there is a much more richer subatomic world. And how they discover it is through cosmic ray. High energy particles from space interacted with Earth atmosphere, producing unexpected particles, and they are captured by the scientists as muon and pion. They also use particle accelerator, and this accelerator, like the Large Hadron Collider, review new particles like and they review new particles like quarks, gluons, and bosons, which I will talk about what are they in a while. So families of particles, this is something that scientists came up with, and there are two types of particles, leptons. These are the fundamental particles that do not experience strong, strong nuclear force, like electron and neutrinos. Whereas hadron, which is something we'll dive deeper into, is they are made up of quarks, held together by strong nuclear forces, like baryons, include protons and neutrons, and mesons, ion and kion. So scientists discovered that quarks are fundamental particles that combine to form hadrons, like protons and neutrons. So they have charges less than the fundamental charge. So instead of one coulomb, they have two over three, one over three. They never exist independently, always find within a hadron, and they combine to form hadron with e charges equal to E or multiple of E. There are six types of quarks, which I will show you in the next slide. So the six types of quarks are up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. You can see that each type of quarks, they have different amount of charges. So this characteristic defines the behavior of hadrons. So this is how they can combine together. A proton is no longer known as the fundamental part. They are made up of two up quarks and one down quarks, whereas neutron is made up of one up quark and two down quarks. So we also have another type of hadrons like pions and phi. So these are their compositions. So if we were to look closer to beta decay, a neutron is converted to a proton emitting an electron. So if you want to discover the equation at the quark level, this is what it looks like. So one down quark of neutron is being now converted into U, up quark, plus an electron, plus an antineutron. So that's the end of nuclear physics. Thank you so much for watching. I shall see you in the next video.